Okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, so today well, I thought we'd have a quick look at um, a small scale ecosystem um, in the UK and that is a freshwater pond. Excuse the uh, um, bandage cut my um, finger kicking last night. Right, anyway, enough about me. Let's put the heading in there. So it's our, important to remember it's small scale um, this ecosystem. As we know, um, lots of large scale ecosystems like uh, rainforests and deserts, this is our small scale ecosystem and it's a freshwater pond. And we have lots of these in the UK. So what I'd like us to do is to start off drawing essentially the, the bottom of the pond, the kind of rough line and then bringing it up to, there we go, kind of the higher ground over here. And to show the, the pond, just put a nice straight line in. That's our, our water level. Uh, now we know the water level can rise in the winter where there's a bit more rain um, and the spring and it can come right down in the summer and that can be a real problem uh, and have a massive effect on, on the animals and, and plants and things that live there. Now we're going to start with our abiotic uh, features. So those are non-living things like climate, soil and rocks. So if we start by just drawing the sun, okay, um, you can put in there energy from the sun, okay, direct into the pond. Okay, and it does a lot of things for the environment here. And that is We'll put in brackets abiotic okay um, and non-living things are things like climate so temperature rainfall that kind of thing um, soil rocks and sun everything else that we see should be biotic that um, is existing in the pond so things like plants and animals and insects and so on Okay, um, I'm going to start with the bottom of the pond and I'm just going to draw um, what might be down there, which is possibly some stones, some small rocks, that kind of thing, things that are too heavy uh, and drop to the bottom. Um, and also it might include things like rotting plants, stones, decomposers, um, scavengers and things live down there. So if we write pond bottom, which is what we call the bottom of the pond um, and that is a place where there is very little oxygen. Remember oxygen comes from the air and it doesn't really get down to the bottom of the pond too easily so where the movement is in the water that's where the oxygen will be not too far down so there's little oxygen, uh, little light so depending on the depth of the pond obviously but little light, um, rotting plants or decomposing plants, stones, and the things that might live down there, we'll draw them in a second, but things like um, decomposers, like pond snails, worms, uh, and scavengers live here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So we're talking again, weren't we, about things that might live down there. Well, first thing I'm going to draw, I don't know if that's very good, is um, a water worm. Just put a little arrow to it. Water worm. Just similar to the kind of worm that might live in your back garden, but this one lives um, happily in water. And then we'll also have, this is a bit more grim. Uh, this is a sort of a maggot with like a ratty tail, so that's called a rat tailed um, maggot. Sort of thing that if you went dredging in a pond you might find. Um, another one that is very very small is a water flea. Just a little parasitic insect. Okay, they, they all exist in that realm at the bottom of the pond. Now something that might 
move down there but go back up again is something called the great diving beetle um, so we'll just draw that one in I think it's gonna be easier to draw these and that way you're perhaps a bit more likely to remember them so not the best drawing but there we go so this is called the great diving beetle and there's lots of different beetles that live there and this is only going to be a, a small selection of, of creatures that live in the water and plants as well um, so the first plant in fact that we will bring into play is a water lily something really synonymous with ponds so they have this really really long stem and then it branches out into the bottom of the pond with a number of different roots and on the surface it gets quite wide and actually it can flower as well and it's, it goes wide like that to uh, get as much sunlight as possible so that's our water lily now other plants and things that live in the water um, is something called algae which is spelt sort of algae like that algae and that's um that's something that can live on the very surface of the water and it can clump together. It can be actually quite stringy in nature and also it can be just small small amounts as well in the water. It can make your pond go very green in the summer because it, again, absolutely loves that sunlight and it uses it to grow. Um, so let's have a little look. We've got life above the surface. So here's our surface got above the surface which is a whole sort of section of the ecosystem this is a place where birds visit and food is found basically on the water or possibly just into the water so I'm gonna write food is found on mostly on or just in the water okay so that's above the surface. And then if we look at the actual surface, so if we call that pond surface, again, underline that. Um, what we need to remember is that there's plenty of light and plenty of oxygen. So the kind of animals that we'll find on the surface are breathing generally through lungs, possibly through their gills, because they might come out a little bit or um, through their skin so plenty of O2 oxygen and sunlight animals uh, breathe through gills um, lungs or even skin, which is slightly less common. Okay, let's keep filling up our pond then. What else do we need to add? We need to add, um, we'll put in, yeah, we'll put in our pond snail. Now remember, uh, this little fella, he can live right down here in the depths, but he can also climb right out of the pond and live um, quite happily breathing uh, fresh air. Yeah, our pond snail is quite versatile, quite a useful creature as well. He'll eat things like algae, he'll eat um, decomposing plants and, he, and animals actually. He's an omnivore and he'll keep the pond pretty clean. So you often find lots and lots of snails. In fact, just to illustrate that, just pop another one in there. Lots of, uh, lots of snails. Um, I'm not going to draw a frog. Frogs are very synonymous with, with ponds, but I'm, I will just put a couple of little tadpoles in there okay just a couple maybe three there we go as they are again baby frogs they live in the shallows of the pond um, and they're part of that ecosystem but the real top dog if you like in the pond not out of the pond i'll come to that in a minute but in the pond are the fish okay and i'm not gonna draw a huge fish because this isn't a very big pond but um, drawing that I've got here but a common one is uh, something called a stickleback and 
they start off life very, very small, not very big at all, um, but they can get quite large. So if we just write um, stickleback, is the is type of fish, but in brackets, um, lots and lots of smaller fish live in ponds. Okay, and these, this is a, a wild pond if you like. This isn't one you'd have in your back garden with your koi carp and your and your goldfish. Um, a stickleback is a more native um, type of fish to the UK. Um, so then when we're thinking about this kind of mid-water zone, we just have an arrow. That's our mid-water zone of the pond. Um, you do need to be, you need to have gills, okay, and gills are these sort of filtration systems which take the oxygen out of the water and help the fish to breathe. So again, let's just write in, animals breathe through gills or skin, there are some that breathe through their skin, and we did say, didn't we, in this area, fish are the main predators. Okay. Now remember fish, worms, um, worms, pond snails, maggots, they're all what we call biotic features of a pond and that is living. For example, any kind of plant any kind of fish or animal. Okay, great. So we've got the pond bottom, we've got above the surface, the surface, the mid-water section. Now we're gonna look at this, this area here, which you might think, well, why is she, why is she looking at that? It's, it's not the pond, but this is what we call the pond margin. And sometimes when the, when the water level's high, the pond margin is quite small. And then when the pond, mar when the water level drops, the pond margin increases. Okay, so it's a, it's a fluctuating dynamic um, area of the pond and it's generally home to most of the um, vegetation that you might find. So let's put some vegetation in. So the first thing I'm going to pop in is some bulrushes. Again, a reminder, you know, we're thinking about, um, you know, native uh, plants and vegetation and these are really spectacular they can grow incredibly tall and they provide lots of um, food and security uh, for different kinds of plants and animals so there we go we've got our bulrushes uh, which is a type of reed there's others but this is the example we're going to include um, and then the other main plant that we're going to pop in here is, well, it could be a number of different ones, um, but it's like a pond marigold and it's very leafy and it is quite happy to have its leaves in the water or out of the water, um, which is why it's such a good pond plant and it kind of trails around like this. If you want to just draw it on and then add the leaves, that's absolutely fine. And it's a flowering plant, so it's good for insects as well. Um, and the other thing that we see quite a lot of is grass too. Now, grass is a really good hiding place, uh, particularly for one of the main predators that we find at ponds and that is of course the heron. So I'm hoping that I've given myself enough space to do this. There we go. Yeah so the heron obviously is on the lookout for, for fish isn't it? Um, but it will hide often in long grasses, it will sneak around on its long legs looking to get those sticklebacks um, and it's it's a consumer so in fact if we put 
we need to get some description in here, don't we? So plenty of oxygen on the pond margin, plenty of light, shelter as well with all these plants, and food. So remember, we're going to have like visiting insects and things as well, aren't we? I'm just going to write heron on the heron. And the heron is a consumer. The plants are producers. So the plants, basically, they just need sunlight and water, but they mostly use sunlight to create glucose, uh, which is like a sugar, it's a type of food. Um, so they're very clever, they use photosynthesis to do that, whereas a consumer, like the heron, it can't make its own food from the sun, it needs to eat the plants or eat the fish, uh, which feed on the plants. So we'll come to food webs later on, but if you just put plants are producers, putting that word in capitals because that's an important keyword, which convert sunlight into food by photosynthesis. And I'm sure your science teacher will take you through that process in more uh, depth in the classroom. So what else? So one more thing. I think we talked about insects, didn't we? And we didn't really um, draw one. So let's just pop, where should we put him? Mm, kind of want to put him here. Let's put a little dragonfly. So we've got wings. They have two wings, amazing things, dragonflies. And they live predominantly, not always, but predominantly in ponds or near ponds. There we go. They'll eat like midge larvae and uh, they'll pick at um, a lot of the plants and things that live in ponds. So there you have it. Your biotic and abiotic features of a small scale ecosystem of a freshwater pond.